Uh, I'm joined today by Mustafa Ali, who until recently ran the Environmental Justice Program at the Environmental Protection Agency. Mustafa, thank you uh, for joining me. Uh, and my first question to you is, uh, really, you, you, you were there, you were there under Republican and Democratic administrations, you've been there since 1992, uh, but you left. Why did you leave? Um, I left on March the 8th of this year, um, and uh, I left for a couple of reasons, actually. Um, you know, I took a look at some of the proposals and actions that were moving forward, um, and I just saw a different set of priorities and values. Now, I work for a number of different administrations, as you know, um, and I never saw sort of this concerted effort to dismantle and deconstruct the basic protections that are necessary for all of our communities, but especially our most vulnerable communities. I knew I couldn't be a part of that. And, and I also knew, and you know, some folks have said, well, Mustafa, why don't you just keep your head down? Why don't you just take a desk over to the side? And I said, you know, there's a, a very good reason for that. I said that, you know, the communities that I had served for over two decades don't have time for anyone um, to, to, you know, just do that because they're dealing with these impacts in their communities 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So they don't have time for to wait for us to continue to move forward on, on not only helping to better protect them, but also giving them access to information uh, and helping to make real change happen. Now, Mustafa, uh, you were there at the beginning. You were one of the founders of this office in, I think it was 1992, am I right, in the George H.W. administration? That's correct, November of 1992. And yeah, actually, the and office got uh, founded out of a set of recommendations from stakeholders. Yeah, you were, you were one of the first. That was a Republican administration. Uh, you were, I believe, in the George W. Bush administration as well. Do I have that right? Yes, that's correct. And uh, so it's, this is not a, a matter of political partisanship. You were there in two Republican administrations, and you left in March because you, fe you felt that this administration really was qualitatively different in terms of its approach to the environment than the George H.W. or the George Bush administration and obviously the Clinton and Obama administrations. Yes, I've never seen anything quite like this before. And I, I am under no uh, illusion that each new administration is going to have a different set of priorities, uh, policies that they're going to move forward on. But I never saw in all those years an administration that was so set uh, on doing things that I knew would be destructive. I wasn't guessing, it wasn't theory. I knew because of spending so many years on the ground in communities and working here in Washington, D.C., um, that what they were moving forward on would have devastating effects to vulnerable communities. I want to get uh, to the whole issue of environmental justice in a moment, but can you give us a sense of what you saw in the Trump administration, in this uh, Environmental Protection Agency, that you found so shocking? Well, you know, um, we can go down a litany of different types of things. You know, their disregard for science was one. Um, and, you know, science is a, is a basic sort of foundational element that all of the agencies and departments use. And, you know, it's founded on the law and science, uh, and then utilizing that to help to move forward with policy and making change uh, in, in, a, in a positive way for our country. So science was one. Uh, the other one was around enforcement. So if you don't have uh, a proper enforcement program, um, then you have the types of situations that we're now seeing with Harvey, with chemicals being moved around, uh, with leases that happen. Um, and these are happening not only when storms come, but on a regular basis inside, especially our most vulnerable communities. Many people say frontline communities, communities with environmental injustice. Um, so I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I, I mean, you. I guess it must have taken quite a lot of, well, a high threshold for you to decide that you were actually going to leave when you've devoted so much time and attention in a bipartisan way to issues that are so important and becoming more and more important. I mean, did you say to yourself, uh, am I doing more good than by leaving the, by, than, than staying? Could I have more influence by staying? Uh, did you have that kind of dialogue with yourself? I did. It's actually a, a really funny story now that I look back. Um, so, you know, I, I did a lot of praying on it before and uh, talking with my parents and, and other mentors. And I remember I kept setting sort of these benchmarks and I kept saying, well, I said, Lord, if this happens, then I'll leave. Uh, and something happened. And then I said, well, you know what, maybe I didn't, uh, maybe uh, I'll wait till the next thing. 
And eventually, um, it was uh, funny, I was talking to my mom about it. She said, well, if you're waiting for a burning bush, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> and uh, I actually decided then, um, after I saw so many of these egregious behaviors, so many uh, egregious attempts at rolling back things, uh, at slashing budgets, uh, a number of things that I you know, decided to leave. And it was tough because uh, you know, growing up there, um, I actually developed family uh, inside of the agency and other agencies and departments, so it was extremely tough. Well, in my book, you're one of the real heroes that kept not only the environment uh, front and center, but environmental justice, uh, inequality, I mean, and you have been at it for so many time, so long. And I want to stress uh, that this is a bipartisan issue. The Environmental Protection Agency was created under Richard Nixon. You were starting this issue, this 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 focus on environmental justice under the George H. W. administration. I mean, uh, this is a this is something that we never thought of as a partisan issue, and yet we have an administration that is just uh, reversing tied in so many ways. Uh, let's talk about some of the specifics uh, of environmental justice. I mean, do you think, um, like Harvey, like Hurricane Harvey, I mean, there are a lot of toxic chemicals that were released. Uh, are those toxic chemicals and the, re and, and the, uh, the effects of Harvey, are they disproportionately affecting poor communities and especially poor communities of color? Uh, without a doubt. Um, and what you'll see is uh, in, in a number of different ways. So, you know, this current administration, the, the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, you know, in the president's budget had moved forward on cutting the Superfund program by around 25 to 30 percent, depending on the numbers that you look at. Uh, we know that, and these are some of the most toxic sites across the country, and we know that disproportionately those are in communities of color, low-income communities, and indigenous uh, populations. So what you find is, in a situation with this flooding, is that um, many of those chemicals have now moved off of, or could be moving off of, uh, the, these toxic sites uh, and landing in people's backyards, um, landing in schoolyards, you know, so forth and so on. Um, so there is some disproportionality that's there. But if you also look, even if the storms hadn't done this, you still find this disproportionality that's happening in that space. And let me get real specific to give people some examples that maybe will help them to understand. Also in, in relationship to the air pollution issues, the Manchester community, which is right there in Houston, Texas, is primarily a Latino community and, and, and a, a small population also of African American and working class white folks. In this community uh, that has all these chemical plants and other facilities literally surrounding them, if you went there and you looked, you would literally see more piping then you would see trees. And when you would roll down your windows, and I've been there a number of times, you actually feel like you're breathing gasoline fumes in this uh, community on a fairly regular basis. And Cesar Chavez High School is there. Um, and the students who go to these schools that are there are expected to learn, yet they are breathing these toxic chemicals uh, on a regular basis. And, and those are some of the, the, the disproportionate impacts that are happening. If you look at a community like Port Arthur, Texas, that also was impacted from the storm uh, and the flooding. This is a community also that is surrounded. Uh, there's flaring that happens on a regular basis. Hilton Kelly, who is a Goldman Prize winner, so that's the highest award you can get uh, in the environmental context. Uh, he was there as the flooding started, and he had his granddaughter with him and picked her up as the flooding was starting, and the plants were doing some shutdowns at that time, and there was a huge amount uh, of chemicals that were released as they have to shut down. And all of them blew into their community and I was talking to him and he was telling me about how his eyes were burning and his throat was burning, but he was even more concerned that he had his baby granddaughter in his arms um, and that she was breathing in these emissions. And he usually doesn't have his granddaughter there because of the air quality uh, issues that, that often you know are happening in that community. These are the types of environmental injustices that we have to address. Folks should not be placed uh, this close to these plants. Literally in the Manchester community, the first one that I referenced, you can go in people's backyards. You can literally reach your arm out across the fence and touch the piping that's inside of these plants. If most folks in our country knew that something this egregious was happening, they would one, not probably believe it, and two, if they saw it for themselves, they would say, how is this possible? 
Well, not only would they say, how is this possible, but presumably a lot of people just don't know that as the environment changes, as we experience man-made climate change, and it's happening faster and faster, it is the poorest and most vulnerable citizens who are being affected immediately and worse because they live in places and in housing that is most vulnerable to these environmental changes. Uh, and, and what you're saying is that Houston is a prime example. Houston is an example, Port Arthur, Texas, Bayview, Beaumont, so many of the communities, New Orleans, of course, with Katrina. And then there are some other dynamics that go on also in vulnerable communities. One of them is having the ability to be able to escape uh, when these storms are, are coming. And as you rightly said, they are going to be happening more and more often because, you know, seas are rising and because of uh, rising temperatures. Uh, you know, water temperatures are rising, also putting more moisture into the atmosphere. So more and more of these communities are going to be, you know, caught in this crosshair, if you will. The other dynamic is that once the storms are over, you know, and unfortunately in many instances, you know, we build low income housing on the cheapest land. And in many instances, it's on floodplains and other areas. Of course, uh, President Obama tried to make sure that we had some regulations in place to limit that, and if we do build in, in those types of areas, that we have to build to the to the new dynamic that's there or the new paradigm, understanding um, that we need to build higher or we need to make sure that we're not building in these spaces based upon 100-year, 500-year floods and those types of things. And, and sometimes people don't realize that this housing is being placed in these types of areas that we have to address. Uh, and then, you know, people coming back, and so we'll talk more about those other dynamics. Mustafa, what is it about the Environmental Protection Agency under Donald Trump and under Scott Pruitt that makes it so insensitive? Why are we seeing what is happening occurring when we did not see it under George W. Bush or under George H. W. Bush? What is motivating these people to basically turn their backs not just on the environment but on environmental justice? Well, you know, I think there are a number of dynamics there. I, I think on a basic element, you have uh, an administration that is continually surrounding themselves with folks uh, who are not connected to real people in real communities. And what I mean by that is in every administration that I ever worked for, one of the things that I always suggested uh, was that you go out and you spend time in communities having real conversations with Mrs. Ramirez or Mr. Johnson before you start moving forward on the development of policy or the elimination of policy, because I believe that it changes the way that you have to look at the actions that are necessary, because you then have some real world experience. And I haven't seen to date, and I've had conversations with leaders across the country um, to ask the question, has the administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency been to your community and spent any time having conversations with you? To date, I have not been able to find one uh, that says that they have been able to experience that yet. I also have not seen the president spend any real time with communities. So I think that that, on a basic level, uh, is one of the, the challenges that are there. Well, the president did go to the Houston area twice. Uh, was that uh, just for the cameras? I don't want to be too harsh and cynical about it. Well, I'll say this. Uh, he did not go to the Manchester community or any of the other communities that have been traditionally disproportionately impacted. Uh, and all of them would have loved for him to be able to come, uh, to have a conversation, to see the types of things uh, that they've been dealing with, or at least hear their stories, uh, so that when he went back and began to advocate for funding, uh, not just here in, the, in sort of the response and recovery phase, but also thinking forward about, you know, how do we properly revitalize communities? Um, I think that is a missed opportunity um, that he didn't do that. Um, you know, I think it's great that, you know, he uh, had the opportunity to, you know, uh, hug some babies uh, and, and have uh, some conversations there and, and sort of, uh, you know, a, uh, you know, sort of there in the centers and those types of things. Very, very important. And, and I appreciate that. But it's also very important to actually get out into those communities or at least bring those folks in um, and, and have some real conversations, something that I often call real talk. And what about the power of large corporations to get their way? Are you seeing or have you seen during your very distinguished career uh, in environmental justice at the EPA, 
Have you seen any sign that maybe the Trump administration is more sensitive to the needs or desires of big corporations from Wall Street than other administrations, even other Republican administrations? Well, you know, I think I'll go back to just a conversation we had just a couple of minutes ago. So the uh, current administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency has spent uh, time with business and industry leaders, has went to uh, those conferences, uh, symposiums, other types of events to engage, but yet has not spent that same uh, amount of time uh, with community leaders. Um, so that would share with me that there is a uh, intersection point or an entrance uh, for those who represent fossil fuel companies and other types of industries. Um, they have a seat at the table, um, but I have not yet seen a seat at the table uh, for everyday common folks uh, who are dealing with uh, the impacts that sometimes come from uh, these facilities uh, and, and these industries. And what you're saying is that many of these everyday common folk are going to be experiencing the consequences of these toxic effects for years and years and years to come. It's not just a matter of cleaning up Houston or Southeast Texas or Louisiana. It's actually these people are are going to bear the, the effects of what has happened, maybe their children and grandchildren, in one example you gave. Yeah, well, you know, and, it, and, and the public health effects, you know, sometimes those are acute and sometimes they're chronic. And, and I always think, because I think very holistically about these issues. So when we start to have a debate around health care and uh, creating or limiting the access that people have to health care uh, who are being impacted in these instances, um, you know, you're really putting them at a grave disadvantage. Um, because, you know, once you're exposed to some of these chemicals, or let's say even uh, the example in Flint, when you're exposed to lead, it follows you uh, throughout your lifetime, and you need to be able to have health care coverage. Um, so these issues are going to follow folks. It also begins to extract wealth from communities. So I've seen plenty of traditional communities that have been there and then facilities and others come in. I have yet to see their property values raised when that happens in many instances. You know, it begins to decrease, which then creates less wealth for those communities. Uh, by creating less wealth, it also lowers the tax base. When you lower the tax base, then it means that there's less money going to education. Um, so it's very cyclical uh, and in many of these communities, the impacts uh, and how they play out over generations. And Mustafa, very often we tend to think of inequality and the environment and health issues and racism as all separate issues. But what you are saying is that they are all completely inter interrelated. You can't really talk about the environment without talking about inequality. You can't talk about inequality without talking about the environment and public health. You can't talk about any of them without talking about the issues of race and ethnicity and who is really bearing the burdens. Without a doubt, it is all interconnected. Uh, I hear many people talk about intersectionality, uh, a holistic approach. So just like on the negative side of the coin, when we're not really laser focused on how to really address change uh, inside of our most vulnerable communities, um, you know, there are some real uh, disproportionate impacts that happen there. But when we do get focused, um, the flip side of the coin is that we can really revitalize communities and help them move them from surviving to thriving. Yeah, well, let's, I, I, I don't want to take you and take your time too much. I, I do, though, want to just go exactly where you are going to a more hopeful place. I mean, uh, many people I talk with, when they're looking at environmental change, climate change, man-made climate change, uh, they say, uh, we're, we're past the point of inevitability. Uh, really, it's a matter of adjusting to these changes. But the question really is, if we are there, are we going to adjust to these changes in a way that is socially just? Are we going to adjust to these changes in a way that actually includes all our people rather than just the people who are situated because of wealth and privilege uh, in such a way that they're not going to be impacted? Are you, do you, are you hopeful about this? I'm very hopeful. My, everybody says I'm extremely optimistic, but I'm optimistic because I believe in the innovation and ingenuity of our people um, and that if we you know, truly believe in equity and equality, we can, we can move in that direction. Um, but, you know, if we move toward uh, renewables, which we have to do, um, we have to make sure that there's equity in that process as well. 
um, understanding that, you know, um, especially lower income communities, there may be some additional challenges that are in that space and we need to be thinking through that. Uh, and we need to make sure that their voices are honored in that process and are helping to think through uh, the best ways of moving forward. As we start to look at advanced manufacturing opportunities um, as well, um, we need to make sure that the folks who have been impacted uh, by climate change also have an opportunity to participate fully in, in, in sort of that industry um, as well. We can make the changes that are necessary. Yes, there are going to be impacts that are going to happen based upon what's been in the past, but we can, we, we can move in the right direction. We can, and I guess the political question is will we and when we, when will we? Uh, Mustafa, I want to thank you not only for giving us the time, giving me the time of this interview, but also for your years and years of dedicated public service in one of the most important but most overlooked areas, and that is that intersection between inequality, widening inequality, and also increasing the, the effects of climate change. Uh, you are a real hero. I'm sorry, in a way, you're not there fighting the fight inside, but uh, I'm very glad you're outside and you're going to continue to fight that fight. Well, thank you. Uh, I often say that if, if we can address the issues that are happening in our most vulnerable communities, then we can truly strengthen our country um, and we can make, you know, the, the, the changes that are necessary to keep us, uh, you know, in a leadership position. Well, thank you, Mustafa. Thank you.